First of all, welcome, welcome to you all. And I would like to thank you for coming. I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting for the invitation and our speakers. Every day on the TV and on newspapers, we read about new scientific discoveries, technological applications in the fields of robotics and artificial intelligence. Sometimes these news lead to the description of uh, uh, fantascientific futures with the robots that they have their own mind and this in a way creates uh, some kind of a fear and uh, some kind of uh, um, concern among the public because we do fear that the human factor might be replaced by an algorithm since we do not have the right uh, means we often do not uh, distinguish between uh, what is uh, actually just a scientific scenario and what can actually happen. Today, uh, we will carry on a dialogue that has always been present at the meeting with uh, high-level research and scientists. Last year, we started to deal with the theme of men and new technology. We also have uh, the what space uh, created by Eurasis and the campus, where you have uh, every day meetings with the scientists, philosophers that are involved in these uh, themes. And there are also some concrete examples that we can experience firsthand. In tonight's uh, session, uh, we will talk about uh, the relationship between men and machines with uh, a reference to the impact of machines on human life and, in particular, artificial intelligence. We would like to uh, approach this uh, theme avoiding two different uh, states of mind, that is to say, a complete faith in a technology that avoids uh, the acknowledgement of uh, the challenges, or on the other hand, an unjustified, unjustified uh, fear of hostile future scenarios. So the only possible approach is the uh, realism we have inherited from our uh, fathers that helps us really analyze this reality in order to get to know it better without prejudice. So in order to do this, tonight we invited two scientists, high-level scientists, to be here with us, and we really thank them for accepting our invitation. I will introduce them we have Gianfranco Pacchioni and Nello Cristianini. Uh, this um, session will be based on two uh, speeches, and then if th there is a some time, there will be some questions for our speakers. Gianfranco Pacchioni is a vice rector for research at the University Bicocca in Milan, and he deals with quantistic physics. He has graduated in chemistry and works in California at the IBM Research Center. His first speech will deal with the theme of the impact of technologies. Nello Cristianini is a professor of artificial intelligence in Brussels, Brussels and uh, he is carrying out uh, different uh, uh, researches on artificial, artificial intelligence. He has written two books on bioinformatics and he has also been awarded a prize and has a, a grant here, say. Before uh, 
being a professor in Bristol, he was a professor at the University of California. So as you might notice, uh, these are uh, really high-level speakers that we have with us tonight. So I'll now leave the floor to Professor Pacchioni. Very well, thank you. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank for this opportunity to share with me with you uh, this uh, well speech of about 25 minutes, where I'll try uh, to encourage uh, some uh, well reflections. Uh, but I do not think I, I will give you any answers. I will just. Uh, touch upon different themes related to modern technologies. And I would like to start with this slide that shows some objects that are part of our everyday life. These are devices that, uh, well, are very important in our daily life. But uh, only 20, 25 years ago, they did not exist. Some of those didn't even exist 10 years ago. And, uh, well, I'm saying this because I wanted to underline uh, the speed of change in the field of technologies. Some of these items became part uh, of our daily life as a few years ago and are no longer part of it, as, for instance, uh, the digital uh, camera or the iPod. They were revolutionary items when they were uh, put on the market, but then now uh, they have both been replaced by um, smartphones. All these items are very uh, recent uh, realities, just like those uh, that you see now on the slide, because they are really uh, changing our way to interact with other people. So how did all this come about? In the history of uh, science and technology, there are some very particular moments that are not very easy to um, underline. One of this is the um, birth of transistors. Transistors were uh, created on uh, Christmas Eve in 1947 when these three scientists, Bratton, Shocklin, and Pardeen, uh, created this very big object item that amplifies the sound of a human voice. It was not really a revolution in terms of uh, scientific inventions, but it was the beginning of the era of miniaturization. In the 1960s, we have uh, the first uh, integrated uh, circuit. Gordon Moore is one of the founders of Intel, and he foresaw that uh, from the 60s onwards, there will be a doubling of uh, uh, the um, processing of data every two years. In an article published on Popular Electronics um, says that there will be a day when PCs will be sold in supermarkets. In this image, you can see uh, a man that has, uh, well, that is selling uh, a, piece, a PC near someone else who is uh, selling cosmetics. So this was really a vision in 1965, but it is reality today. In the 70s, we have the first personal computers uh, for, uh, well, uh, those of you that, that are no longer that young, you can recognize uh, some of these. It is endearing in a way to look at them, also be in terms of the power they had. And you see here the biggest uh, computer that was uh, built in 19. 46 is the ENIAC. It had 17,000 volts. So uh, all this leads us to a revolution, which is, in my, from my point of view, really very important. That is to say, the arrival of, inter of the Internet in 1989, when uh, the idea of this wide World Wide Web is uh, actually patented. 
But then it's only towards the end of the 90s that the internet becomes a tool that is used by many people. It is real, real revolution in the history of humanity, and it is part of the um, electronic revolution and microelectronic revolution. And uh, today we have 3 billion users, uh, 7 billion uh, phone contracts, 100 billion uh, web pages. So the quantity of information that is available for uh, everyone today is unprecedented. So when we talk about nanotechnologies, well, if I, someone asked me how can we represent nanotechnology, I would give this example, which is a simple example. You see here on the on one side uh, the uh, onboard computer of the Apollo mission in the 60s. It is some kind of box, about a 60 uh, centimeter, with the two megahertz in terms of uh, uh, capacity, and now. On the right, you see an iPhone 7 with a volume that is uh, millions of times smaller and a capacity that is millions of times bigger. With the first device, you see, men went to the moon. With the second one, we surf the net and we go on Facebook. The electronic uh, revolution uh, went on and is now moving towards what we could call the flexible and miniaturized electronics. And this is extremely important because if we think about having devices uh, that are flexible, flexible means that they can be integrated into, uh, for instance, uh, clothes. Uh, there are some uh, um, projects of uh, flexible portable phones that can be stretched. Um, so well, all this has a certain relevance because the miniaturization of these uh, devices that are uh, more and more powerful makes it possible uh, to use them on the human body. So well, uh, that means that uh, it is uh, used on, in the human organism, and this open up, opens up uh, scenarios that are really unprecedented in the history of humanity, as, for instance, uh, the possibility to repair uh, brain damage and uh, to retrieve uh, functions that could be lost uh, by uh, using, by uh, applying these devices. This opens up uh, some uh, questions. Uh, fant science arrived well before uh, the uh, reality, the idea of a cyborg or a cybernetic organism, uh, well, this is an idea that is present in literature. Um, it has been present for a long time. But now we are much closer to this kind of situation than we th might have thought a few years ago. This is an experiment that was carried out about 15 years ago in the United States. Well, uh, some uh, electrodes were implanted in uh, the brain of mice. They were uh, then connected to a portable uh, computer uh, that will, can receive a signal that actually gives instructions to the mouse. So, well, uh, if the mouse is told to turn left, it turns left, and if it is uh, told to turn right, it turns right. So this uh, made it possible to uh, create uh, some uh, uh, sensations of uh, pleasure and satisfaction in, my, in these mice's, mice. And this, in a way, means uh, uh, that uh, uh, some barriers have been uh, torn down. And uh, this is uh, the transcranial direct stimulation uh, that uh, is based on the passage of low um, current flows in certain areas of uh, the brain to repair a certain damage, but also to stimulate uh, some cognitive uh, um, skills in terms of uh, uh, language, uh, memory, and so on. These studies were carried out in the United States by uh, the military in order to um, help people who 
have depression caused by uh, their uh, service uh, during wars. So, so this, is, this is obviously very stimulating. Nanotechnologies, uh, however, have also another important uh, uh, outlet, another important uh, sector. If we put together nanotechnology and biotechnology, new and interesting scenarios open up. What you see here on the slide is uh, the image of from a movie, from a uh, very well-known uh, movie, Fantastic Voyage, uh, 1966. It really, it even won two Oscars. It is a story of a very intelligent inventors who miniaturize all the objects. It becomes uh, obviously the uh, the um, very interesting for uh, uh, important political superpowers. And in order to save him, uh, he is uh, uh, miniaturized inside a submarine, which is then injected into the uh, body of a man and uh, it actually uh, flows uh, through the system uh, and it even removes uh, uh, um, some uh, blood clog that could endanger the life of this man. So, well, uh, this actually is a precursor of uh, the theme of precision medicine that goes, well, directly to the target, to the disease. Today, when we uh, approach a therapy, well, if we have uh, uh, certain uh, uh, problems, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if we have uh, uh, something wrong in our uh, uh, fingers so, or in our toes, uh, we, can, we have to take a pill that will actually impact on our organism as a whole. So these nanotechnologies actually go uh, directly to the target. So there are great progresses in terms of diagnosis because it uh, is possible to uh, identify uh, the areas that are, are uh, that have a disease, and also the therapeutical point of from the therapeutical point of view, nanoparticles are actually capable of transporting pharmaceutical substances and release them only on those tissues and areas that are uh, uh, that need to be healed. So, well, the, we need first of all to recognize uh, the. Uh, cells that need a, a pharmaceutical therapy uh, and then to uh, release the pharmaceutical su substances only to these cells. Since we are talking about machines today, we need to think about the fact that when we reduce the dimension, the size of uh, um, our uh, targets, and for instance, when we talk about molecules, we can talk about molecular uh, machines, uh, that is to say devices that can uh, do some kind of work. A uh, um, molecular uh, machine needs to carry out a certain task according to the very specif specific instructions, so it needs very specific information. And, uh, well, it is also necessary to have the energy to make it work. On the uh, blue uh, picture, you s can see a real molecular machine. There is a, a, a car an atom of carbon. Uh, this uh, ring, the yellow one, can actually uh, go back and forth, and it is uh, uh, actually um, moved by um, Protons and uh, it uh, well actually it doesn't have a real uh, a, a real uh, purpose, but it just shows that, the, that there is the possibility uh, to uh, build to create uh, functioning objects. Uh, so last year the Nobel uh, Committee gave the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to three great scientists uh, that uh, deal with molecular uh, machinery machines. Uh, and uh, Baltani, who invented uh, this device that I was showing you before, did not receive uh, uh, the award. But anyway, if we look at nature, nature works as a sophisticated molecular 
machine, the synthesis of proteins in our cells is carried out by uh, RNAs and uh, by ribosomes and uh, they take our amino acids they chain them together according to a very specific scheme pattern when the protein is complete uh, the protein is released in the cell and uh, a new cycle a new synthesis can start everything is done in a very efficient way with almost no uh, errors and without producing any noise. So this is obviously an extraordinary machine um, that is the result of our ev evolution and is now reproduced by men. This uh, a new path leads to very important innovations uh, that could cause some kind of concern. This is a, an article that was published by Science. This is a synthetic bacteria that was um, processed on the computer from uh, amino acids that were uh, uh, cloned, uh, that were uh, then uh, uh, grown, and uh, this then leads to the replication and leads to a genome, uh, 473 genes. It's not very big, uh, but it is something that is out auto reproduce, self reproducing. So, this is something that uh, leads to, to some kind of revolutionary uh, situation. One of these revolutions took place a few years ago. In 2013, there was a very important scientific event. I could ask you if you have ever heard of uh, the exposure, and uh, I do believe that you know what it is. But I think that if I ask you what the CRISP technique is, um, well, not many would answer that they have. This technique, however, is going to have important impact on our life in the future. CRISP is a biotechnique. It's actually uh, genetic engineering that enables us to intervene on the DNA, uh, cutting some pieces of DNA, uh, replacing them, thus modifying in a very precise way our DNA. It's like a, um, a scissor that uh, uh, cuts through chemical uh, um, chains. So this uh, technique has been used to modify the DNA of plants and animals. This is uh, uh, an article that was published uh, two weeks ago here. The CRISP technique was used for the first time to modify uh, a human embryo uh, responsible. Well, it, we needed to isolate a gene that is the cause for uh, heart problems. Obviously, the development of this embryo was blocked, uh, but uh, uh, if uh, this uh, uh, growth would have been uh, carried on, uh, then uh, the children that would be born uh, would have been free from this uh, uh, disease and their children as well. So this opens up a series of uh, questions as well as a lot of interesting perspectives. So now, I think I have a couple more minutes. I would like to go back to uh, Primo Levi, a very famous author who wrote uh, about his experience uh, in uh, uh, the concentration camps. He was actually um, a, um, a scientist. And in the uh, 60s, uh, he wrote uh, some uh, short stories uh, where he actually anticipated some of the themes we're dealing with today. And I will mention two of these short stories. So there is this uh, first one uh, that is based on a dupli duplicator uh, that is called Mimet. Uh, and uh, uh, this machine can reproduce uh, uh, objects, uh, for instance, uh, 
document uh, in all of their uh, characteristics. So it was uh, uh, a way to reproduce uh, the atoms of an object, uh, respecting also the chemical composition of this object. It was a, revol a revolutionary technique, an organic synthesis at a, a low temperature. Uh, so this, is, uh, Primo Levi said, is uh, the dream of four generations of uh, scientists. And uh, so he starts to duplicate, for instance, banknotes uh, just for fun. But he also then tries uh, to duplicate uh, living beings, first a fly, then a lizard. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, well, this doesn't really turn out uh, to be a success. Uh, so then he has to modify the machine. At a certain point, uh, he tries to duplicate his wife, uh, and in the end, he has two wives. Uh, then, well, uh, his life uh, becomes quite a difficult uh, life with the two wives, obviously. And then, in the end, he decides to, uh, well, uh, solve the problem by uh, duplicate himself. So he goes into the machine and makes a double of himself. Why am, t am I telling you this? Well, because uh, this is an anticipation of another important uh, discovery, that is to say, uh, the duplication of uh, um, an object, the creation of a clone, but also the three-dimension uh, printer, which is something that is, uh, well, which is now part of our uh, lives. Uh, uh, but it can really uh, change many of the processes that are used today. And, uh, well, there is also the bioprinting, the 3D bioprinting, that is to say the uh, creation of part of organisms through these processes. Obviously, it is a very complex uh, process that could all fail in the end, but, uh, well, uh, these are, uh, well, um, are at the moment uh, possible uh, developments. Then there is another short uh, story by Primo Levi, which is linked, related uh, to virtual reality. reality. Here you see Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the founder of uh, Facebook. Facebook is investing a lot of money in the development of these uh, visors uh, to, for, for virtual reality, and there is a reason for this. Uh, well, we talk a lot about the change of professions in the near future, and uh, um, this obviously will have an impact on uh, the jobs that we can have. So uh, this means that in the future people will have a lot of free time. And uh, in order to uh, have something to do in this uh, free time, um, they, they are now trying to think about these visors, uh, this uh, uh, artificial reality. And uh, Primo Levi, uh, in this uh, short story, talks about a machine. He talks about the Andrak, a revolutionary device based on uh, the direct communication of uh, nervous circuits and electronic circuits. So with a small uh, surgical intervention, it is possible to um, make, uh, for instance, uh, uh, drive a car uh, through nervous impulses. But I would like uh, also to talk about uh, the another device, Torek, with uh, no intervention, surgical intervention. The transmission of the registered sensations uh, takes place uh, through uh, skin electrodes. Uh, the listener, the user, needs only to wear a helmet. And then uh, Primo Levi gives a series of examples uh, when well, a person wears this helmet that registers the sensations, the feelings of this person that can then relive them again and again. And he says that he wears one of these helmets to uh, uh, listen to a, a record of uh, a, um, a sport event, and he feels like uh, as if he were really at the stadium. He can see the ball going to the goal, and he can really participate in the game. He feels the adrenaline going through his body, and he really lives this uh, experience that is something that uh, obviously uh, could not be part of our reality. So I, this is all very nice, but then uh, Primo Levi 
tells a series of uh, different other uh, events uh, that are uh, about other uh, extreme experiences. And I will now read out uh, some of uh, the uh, well last sentences of this story. It says, poor Simpson, I believe that th that's the end for him. After so many years uh, where he worked for the NAFTA, the, the uh, last uh, NAFTA machine has uh, defeated him. He has uh, uh, fought against the Torek, but, uh, he, and he has uh, sacrificed everything, his life, uh, even his uh, wife. It, the Torek, however, uh, makes you addicted and uh, uh, you can use uh, the different records over and over again. So Simpson is never uh, bored when he uses these records, but when the record ends, then he is really bored. So the only thing he can do is he, to use another record. So he now uh, spends about uh, 18, 20 hours a day with the Torek. Without the Torek, it would be lost, but with the Torek, is uh, he is lost anyway. So this uh, wisdom that had been acquired uh, through this electronic uh, circuit, and Simpson knows it and is uh, ashamed of this, and, uh, uh, well, it takes refuge in the Torek. He is about, uh, he knows he it will die soon, in, but he does, he's not afraid because he has already experienced death in one of these records. Thank you. Now, I give the floor to Nello Cristianini for the next speech. Thank you very much. I don't have a presentation, so I will speak of the cough in a quiet, informal way. When I was 13, maybe I was a quiet, unusual boy because I used to spend a lot of time alone in my room with my computer, and that may sound normal today. Well, the traditional bit of a story of a boy spending time with a computer, but it was 1981. And well, nobody else had a computer. I had the ZX80 that I could program in basic. It was connected to a TV set and I used to create uh, small programs and video games, and I loved astronomy a lot of the time. Then I went to high school, and at one point, I needed uh, some uh, Greek classes after school, and there was uh, an old priest who used to help me, Don Antonio, and uh, one afternoon, he knew that I had a computer. He was a Salesian, and he was so curious about it. He asked me to, to see it, and uh, he told me, well, I heard so much about computer. i never seen a computer. I'm already quite old. Can I see one? Well, we made arrangements, and he came to my place, and he saw my computer. And when he saw that box connected to the TV set, he asked me, almost in a hostile way, please switch it on. It took a lot of time, by the way. And he told me, ask the computer when Alessandro Magno was born. Alexander the Great. And he told me, no, ask the computer when Alexander the Great was born. And I told him, well, this is for video games, for other things. I was 13, he was 8, probably, or even older, and so I tipped. So when was Alexander the Great born? And uh, the answer was syntax error. Wow, and I was so disappointed, Don Antonio. I looked very disappointed, and he pulled the face. And I told him, well, I can create a program in two minutes, and I made one. And again, 
he answered uh, 30, 26 or 356 uh, before Christ. And uh, I showed it to Don Antonio and I told him, told him, well, now we have the program. Now the computer is going to answer our question. And uh, I typed in the question with the program and uh, the computer answered. But this time he was not happy. And he said, well, of course, he knows because you told it. And I said, well, that's the way computers work. And he said, these machines will never be better than us. That's what he told me. Because uh, he said, well, he knows what you tell it. Well, and I've been thinking about that answer for a long time, especially when I saw Siri for the very first time. The very first question I asked me when I saw it, and maybe it was unconscious. I'll try. Let's see if it works. I said, when was Alexander the Great born? July 356 uh, before Christ. Uh, that's what Siri answers. Don Antonio probably heard it as well. And I decided to travel back in time to try to better understand these things. And in the meantime, I had become an expert of artificial intelligence. And uh, I know how these machines work. And uh, well, if I could go back in time and go back to 1981, what could I say to Don Antonio to tell him that these boxes connected to TV set would have done uh, other things. And uh, in a couple of years' time, somebody would invent Windows. And in 10 years' time, anybody would have Windows Home to write uh, with a computer. And everybody is going to connect to 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 these machines with, with telephones and write mails and messages. And maybe people will start working together online to write an encyclopedia, Wikipedia. I don't know what Don Antonio would say today. And maybe in 25 years uh, now, from now, computers will be uh, pocket size. And maybe in 30 years time, we will have algorithms reading Wikipedia, understanding the context, understanding the questions uh, formulated in a sort of normal language and could answer like Siri just did, like my phone has just done, like the smartphone does. And that would have sounded unthinkable, unimaginable at the time in 1981. Nobody would have believed it. And so how is it so, how is it that we have come to this point? Well, I'm measuring time, so let's it. Let's see. So the story of how we got to this point with these algorithms likely to answer these questions is an incredibly interesting story. And this is a story I know quite well because I'm a little tweeny, teeny weeny part of that story. But first of all, artificial intelligence well, was invented 60 years ago. It's not new at all. But for the first 40 years, well, actually, it didn't come up with anything useful. From the 50s on, people tried to program computers in order to make them do what we think is based on the functioning of human intelligence. And they were the first uh, uh, mathematical pioneers. If you ask a mathematician what is the smartest thing a human being can do is uh, sort of explaining uh, theories. And so that had become the symbol of the explanation of theorems. And then playing chess. And chess, playing chess, has become for years, for many, many years, the paradigm of intelligence. And when I was at university playing chess was considered as a paradigm of artificial intelligence and automatic translation or automatic navigation. Well, everything was always sort of referred to to the paradigm of uh, uh, playing chess. Nobody saw an automatic translator or an automatic car in the 80s. But today, instead, we have those devices 
likely to do those things, automatic translation and driving a car by without a driver. But, well, in the past, artificial intelligence was taught and explained, uh, keeping in mind these playing chess paradigm, but actually in the labs, uh, shortcuts had been taken because the system did not work. So at school, people still studied Latin, and then in labs, other things were made. So at school, you studied theorems, uh, uh, you made deductions, uh, and then statistic tricks were used in the labs. So instead of using axioms, so uh, new systems uh, were made in order to recognize uh, handwritten characters, identifying faces and pictures, and other things. And slowly, well, people started getting successful results. Um, good uh, findings, so the first automatic systems to read zip codes automatically on uh, letters were invented, and then other things. So little by little, the so results came. and. Uh, the message was clear. Instead of uh, solving an abstract big issue with deduction, it was much better to learn from examples. So the idea became to collect huge quantities of examples of any sorts, bilingual documents, so building corporates, and then design algorithms learning from those examples. That became the principle, that became the methodology. And this is also today's methodology. Over the last 22 years, my work has been based on machine learning, on uh, sorts of uh, building machines that can learn from examples. And then, so the language of artificial intelligence has come to be the language of deduction and chess, but of uh, mathematical optimization, of statistics, uh, and of pattern recognition, how that's the way it is, it's called. And so chess players were not examples, but, but the new examples were Amazon and Google. The Amazon is great, so it works decently. And uh, very often, well, recommendations made by Amazon are plausible and with no psychological profile of the user, with no profile of the books, simply statistical correlations uh, so based on millions and millions and millions of sales already made by the system. That's it. That's how it works. That's what we do when we want to carry out and create a sort of a sort of autograph characters. There's nothing about the language. It's simply a matter of uh, frequency of uh, letter sequences. That's it. When you type uh, messages on your smartphone, you have a system like the T9, so automatic writing. So the computer is trying to guess what you're going to write simply by comparing what you're writing with millions of other words that uh, it uh, has saved uh, in its memory. That's it, statistics and data, and data comparison, pattern recognition, Facebook can also work and act on contents. You have little space on the screen and millions of contents and, and so on. So thanks to this technology, you can well understand which part of a page of Wikipedia so it has the uh, birth date of Alexander the Great. That's it, it's pure statistics. Siri understands spoken language, understands Wikipedia contents, and then answers, and provides answers. That's it, that's, that's so easy, that's as easy as it is. There's nothing abstract, nothing theoretical, but this methodology requires huge quantities of data. And if an intelligent and smart system was uh, like, uh, a missile, so the fuel would be the data. And for me, the problem has been to uh, come up with algorithms. But now we have the algorithms, so now we need the data. The more data we have, the better the machine works. And that's also the beginning of a new story. But that's the way we have come to this point in time, from Don Antonio until today, radically changing the paradigm. The there was a paradigm shift, and thanks to this paradigm shift, uh, we were able to overcome computer vision, mm, computer translation, speech recognition issues. And that was out of our league in the past, but today we have uh, driverless cars, uh, we have uh, many products that can do automatic translation, but then, what about data? Well, 
How can we get millions and millions and millions of tags and images and pictures and contents of any kind to be used as examples for an automatic learning machine? Well, this is not the story because in the meantime, through an incredible technological convergence, we were able to set up a global infrastructure to exchange data. In the past, it was only the telephone or the TV or telegraph or other systems used by by humans, like the post, the bank, well, everything was replaced by one system based on the internet, largely and mostly, that le allows us to send for free uh, mails and messages. We can watch for free videos and communicate using the same uh, mass communication medium, and the rest is slowly disappearing. So that's the ideal place to collect data, because we are not just passive on that uh, huge infrastructure infrastructure, but the medium infrastructure observes us, watches our behaviors, what we buy, what we write, uh, this, the infrastructure observes our choices and then learns automatically. This may sound a bit maybe not so self-evident. It's quite discreet. The system is quite discreet, but it uh, watches on us. It keeps an eye on us. It learns what we like, what we are interested in, what we need, and uh, which are our reactions. So the infrastructure, the machine, learns from our behavior. So Amazon, Google, Facebook, Twitter, all of this systems that we know far too well to learn from our behaviors and simply by watching us, by observing us. So this is not a telegraph with a copper wire between two massive people, not at all. This is an active medium that is extremely interested in content. It can block sorts of uh, spam, for instance. It can recommend uh, articles or products, this is not passive at all. And there are purposes. Well, Amazon's purpose is to sell books. Google's uh, purpose is to sell um, advertisements. Well, so we communicate to this medium to communicate uh, between and among us. And this infrastructure learns and is interested in contents. And it has their own, its own purpose. And so again, this is how the infrastructure is organized. And we can't live without it. And so the first time we have come across smart and intelligent machines, that it's the internet. And we can't live without internet and this huge infrastructure. We are now forced to use it. So why? And we landed in this condition. Well, because there were some uh, practical and economic advantages. It was clear. Travel agents know, know that f very well, because now we buy plane tickets or we book hotels directly on the internet. Many people are useless today. So this is the disintermediation. So getting rid of middlemen. And that brought about many economic benefits. And there are there were many middlemen, there were travel agents, there were, I don't know, uh, I mean, um, music producers. Today we have Apple that uh, puts music online. There were, were publishing houses which were stronger. Now we have ebooks, uh, there were uh, magazines and newspapers, and now they are in a crisis because nobody wants to buy paper uh, newspapers anymore. And uh, well, so we have uh, got rid of these middlemen, uh, I don't know, publishers uh, and um, travel agents, and now we can publish everything, videos, news. And so this is the so-called disintermediation process that occurred and happened. But we have also come across the first problems because of that, because at one point we realized uh, that, well, all this has also some disadvantages. Uh, some years ago, some states uh, created a surveillance system that uses this global infrastructure to monitor telecommunications, emails, phone calls, Skype, uh, purchasing, information that we read, uh, the things we buy. And uh, many people were surprised. Uh, the press was surprised, everybody was surprised and also got angry. But hey, people, what uh, did we expect? Uh, well, we put everything on this digital system. Well, and now, I mean, uh, you just need a computer to put everything together, apart from advertisement companies. It was inevitable. And then, well, confidentiality, well, and privacy. 
having these machines is something new, is something we're not used to because it never existed in the past. In the last year, other interesting situations occurred. For instance, Admiral, an insurance company in the UK, created a system that decides the price you have to pay to buy a policy for your car. I mean, basing that uh, on your Facebook context because uh, the system uses uh, your personality profile, what you put about yourself, so your online activity provides information that maybe you didn't want to reveal and disclose about your life. Another analytics company in the UK used that very psychometric information to choose uh, electoral message to be sent personally. So each individual received a different uh, uh, electoral campaign messages and that influenced both Brexit uh, referendum and Trump election. I don't know, true, false, I don't know, but this company says that out loud with great pleasure. In the last year, we also saw the broadcasting of uh, fake news. Hillary Clinton campaign was damaged by clearly fake news that circulated on the social media because the algorithm recommending those news were perfectly designed to maximize the number of clicks and not to control truth. And then a big scandal, shock and surprise. Again, what did we expect? We got rid of the middlemen. Well, actually, middlemen were replaced by smart algorithm. There are new middlemen that are today smart algorithm that decide what to block, what to maximize. So now we want uh, Facebook and the others to stop uh, bullying cases or fake news uh, broadcasting. What are they going to do? We need further filters so that uh, TLC systems will be able to decide uh, what to make circular and what cannot be uh, sort of broadcasted. Well, this poses uh, many uh, issues and questions. There's a new dilemma. We have put smart machines at the center of our lives. And uh, there's an American company that has established a program that is called the Compass uh, to decide uh, the prisoners that can be released and those who can't. So there is a sort of uh, provisional sort of analysis of behaviors of people. But what can we say today? So what if uh, an algorithm says a person has to stay in prison? Who can we talk to? Or if an algorithm tells us that our son is going to be totally unsuccessful in a certain school or that we cannot have a mortgage or that uh, we have to pay a very expensive car insurance policy, these are new questions. Apart from the privacy issue, the confidentiality issue, there's uh, a new range of new questions we have to face. And we miss, uh, I mean, cultural elements uh, to face all that. Well, I didn't have fairy tales to tell my children to understand this new reality. This is a different world. What I know is that now research is very fast and uh, persuasive technologies are now being studied. They're going to come. And uh, there's a great pressure to develop the Internet of Things that will connect other parts of our life to our, of our life. Uh, so refrigerators and cars uh, are going to be connected to the Internet and then Bitcoin, so e-payments. And uh, somebody is uh, talking about the algorithmic regulation and all that is coming. We see that coming, and so uh, at first we had more independence because we could get rid of uh, some middlemen and power centers, but now we risk to have new limitations because if algorithm can do so many things, can manage our lives, well then our freedom will be limited, our sort of independence and autonomy. And it's hard to explain all this. It's not easy, not only to explain, but also how to manage that on the basis of which values. This is today's challenge. It's not really about building smart machines, but living with smart machines within our societies. So 
some of these uh, things are not reversibles, but uh, new things are coming, so we can still do something, and we have to think about it now. It's nice to talk about Faust here this year, because we had some advantages and we gave something back. We got power and uh, convenience for free. We made savings, what we gave away a little bit of autonomy, and maybe we're going to lose some more in the future. The public opinion can be easily influenced by these new media, and that's it. And uh, we have uh, a culture structure to understand all that. Well, I don't know how we're going to manage all this, but I'm quite optimistic. In the past, uh, the Environment Protection Movement uh, was able to do something together with other stakeholders in society. Today's world uh, somehow has been improved, uh, but the scientists and engineers uh, cannot uh, act alone. We need uh, artists, we need, uh, I mean, uh, many, many people be involved in this process. The entire society needs to be involved. I don't know what to would, what Don Antonio would say to, uh, today about all this. I don't know if he would have understood all this. But uh, as a humanist, we need to be careful. Well, it's about machines serving us and not us serving machines. This is the key issue. And I think that Don Antonio would understand that. Thank you. I'd like to thank our speakers because they really managed to give us a real uh, picture of the situation. And uh, while well, we have some time for a couple of questions that I have after listening to your speeches, well, it is obvious that the most critical point is not that of uh, scientific research. The critical point, the critical uh, aspect is man. So I have this question. It is clear that the speed of uh, technological development uh, calls for man to adapt quickly to these changes. I really liked the example that you gave of what we uh, look at as an incredible discovery, while in the meantime, we do not notice another discovery which is more important and which will have a stronger impact on our future. So there is a lack of awareness on the part of uh, men in front of uh, this uh, um, quick development. So what can we do? I know this is not an easy question. So what should we do not to be always uh, um, lagging behind what is happening? Well, we have to keep doing what we are doing today here. It is to say to discuss in a very open way discuss these problems. This is something that is not done very frequently. So this question, well, it's not easy. There is no real answer. But as I said during my speech, I do not think that in the history of humanity there has ever been a moment when change was uh, so uh, quick as it is now. And uh, uh, the scientific development has been increased uh, uh, and has been becoming more and more complex because uh, well, there are different themes that are also often 
overlapping this difference between nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, they are overlapping sectors, so to speak. And this makes it difficult for us to have an exhaustive picture of the situation because this is a very rapid um, and unorganized development, so to speak. So, well, since we do not have a general picture of the situation, we could uh, uh, well, be unable to face this uh, development. So the first thing would be to be informed, to follow these changes, these developments. Well, this is not easy, even for people like uh, like us who are uh, in constant uh, contact with this kind of reality. But I do believe that uh, a great majority of the public uh, really ignores what's happening or uh, only sees the positive aspects uh, which are there, but uh, while well, they often neglect uh, the negative aspects, we are actually, actually uh, giving away our personal history, our uh, uh, personal data, and maybe in the future also our genetic data. Uh, uh, we're, just, we're just giving them, giving them away. And this will cause the problems that my colleague has just mentioned. I'm a little bit pessimistic because, uh, well, uh, who can we turn to? Well, the political world uh, has a... Uh, 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 perspective which is, uh, so to speak, uh, a little bit short-sighted uh, if related to these uh, problems, and I'm talking at international level. And uh, so it's not easy to translate uh, a, a a movement like, for instance, uh, the environmental movement that did have an impact uh, on some concrete uh, uh, themes, but it is difficult to translate this at a political level. So, and then, as uh, my colleague was uh, saying, there is uh, something that really worries me that is to say, the manipulation of our uh, society. This is a very delicate, a uh, very sensitive aspect. I'm afraid they could have, we could already have uh, um, gone way too uh, far. So, well, uh, there is obviously uh, the need to uh, make a collective, a, a joint effort uh, to open up our minds, uh, to have an open debate, because uh, we need to find uh, some kind of solution. Uh, Nello, do you want to add something on this? Well, but very briefly, I do not have a solution that I can recommend. I wish I had, but uh, there are uh, well, there is a need for uh, new laws. From the legal point of view, there are gaps, but I do not think that uh, the decision makers will never actually issue these laws if we do not show them that we are interested in them. For instance, uh, uh, th there is the need to have uh, 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 um, products uh, and uh, uh, different uh, also technological products, uh, products and we will always uh, choose uh, those products that are more similar to what we want. The, the starting point is to make clear to everyone uh, what is at stake. I have another question for both of you, and I will start with Nello first. Our dialogue, our well, meeting, our um, session tonight uh, is really strictly related uh, with uh, the title of the meeting because uh, today's uh, generation has uh, problems dealing with uh, these uh, themes uh, and there is no dialogue with the preceding, the previous generation, just like you had problems in explaining what a computer is to Father Antonio, as you said. So our theme is all that you have bequeathed you by your father, uh, earn it in order to possess it. So my question is, what is it that we have uh, to earn again? An educated human being, how can he or she 
approach, not as an expert, obviously, but as a normal <laughs> adult, as a normal grown-up, how can he or she approach these themes? What can we learn from Father Antonio? Well, uh, here uh, I run the risk to say things that are obvious. Uh, this is not the first time that we face such a big challenge. Well, I believe, uh, well, actually, I think that uh, we can uh, slow down in terms of research. For instance, in biology, this is something that happens. Uh, I don't know why this is not done in, informa in uh, information sciences. What is most important, however, is that we need to know what it is, what is really important for us. So th there should be a debate on the values before we talk about laws. Is it more important for us to save some money? Is it more important to give some kind of autonomy to our citizens? So these are all questions that all generations need to deal with. Do we want more uh, uh, safety or do we want more privacy? Uh, uh, as if the two things couldn't really go hand in hand. So there are a lot of dilemmas that we needed to face now. So, for instance, we want uh, that the contents of Facebook are filtered or don't we? So our contribution would be to actually list these dilemmas. Previous generations could actually show, the, or show us uh, the priorities, what we needed to actually evaluate, analyze. Thank you. And now, while the same question um, to Gianfranco. There are a lot of different interesting aspects, but I will go back to the human aspects because both of you used uh, this, uh, this uh, phrase to imitate nature. So it is clear that the reference point is real. It is something that, is, uh, that exists. So, well, I believe that if we look at reality, our fathers have a lot to tell us, to teach us. So. What I wanted to ask you is, how can we avoid that older generations uh, make a step back from this point of view? In one of your books, uh, you talk about the problems of science and the development of scientific research. So you actually deal with uh, the problem uh, of the differences uh, between the generations. So well, what can we actually uh, inherit from our fathers uh, in terms of traditions and what should we earn again in order to, to use it in front of these new technological challenges. Well, at the end of my um, speech, I quoted Primo Levi because I wanted to focus on the fact that, uh, the, that man is at the center of it all. Men have their intelligence, and we can replicate intelligence with the artificial intelligence, but man has also a conscience. And uh, well, if we read these uh, short stories from the 60s, uh, you can see that there is a message by Primo Levi who tries to tell us, I can actually foresee that in the future there are a lot of dangers. So it is important uh, to understand the repercussions. And we are uh, now at this point uh, where these messages have become stronger. So uh, first of all, we need to focus on education and information. And the fact that we are, uh, well, uh, rational uh, beings, but we also have uh, feelings. And machines do not have uh, feelings. I do not think that computers fall in love, for instance. So we do have uh, some characteristics uh, that uh, used to have uh, more room in the past. Today, maybe we give more room to automation. We need to uh, regain the centrality of man through, for instance, uh, uh, 
schools and what is taught in school. But it's not easy, actually, to teach or, uh, this kind of things at school. It is difficult to, to train teachers to deal with these themes. So, well, I believe that we can learn a lot from the past. In the book you were mentioning, I actually explain how we were working as a scientist when I started in the 80s. It was a completely different way of working, uh, but we really actually uh, learned a lot from, uh, well, the scientists of the past, this idea of the masters. Well, this is something that is no longer so important. Our term of comparison is in the net today rather than the masters of the past. So, well, the good masters of the past are those who actually leave us the strongest message, the same message that we want to pass on to the others. So I would like to thank both the speakers that were with us today. Really deserved this round of applause. And I would like to conclude by mentioning an aspect that I, I, it was actually unexpected for me. So the problem is not so much that of robots and the technology and machines, but the, the most important challenge is an educational challenge. Because obviously, uh, technology and scientific research are done by men. So you talked about awareness, uh, values, conscience, uh, education. So these are uh, the, uh, the central points. So the message that emerges from today's uh, session is what we are doing it to what we are doing here today is the best way to face this educational challenge. These themes, the new technologies, need to be debated uh, in order to face this challenge. And this involves everyone uh, in the fields of mathematics, politics, uh, engineering. Everyone needs to face this challenge. So I will uh, uh, put this challenge back to you, to the people who take part in the meeting here in Rimini this year, and then we'll go back to their workplaces. The dialogue will go on tonight uh, with the, the same speakers uh, in a more, uh, well, so to speak, bidirectional way. Uh, well, you will be able to actually ask them questions in the what space that was uh, created by campus, uh, campus and uh, here it is. And uh, I think this is a very nice way to have an interaction. And I would like also to say uh, you can contribute to the meeting uh, through donations. So you have these Donaora points that you will find in uh, the uh, area where our uh, volunteers with uh, the green T-shirt with uh, uh, the Donaora writing uh, will be uh, there for you if you want to donate to create um, Again, a space that is uh, focusing on the educational challenge. Thank again to our speakers. Thank you, and have a very nice evening.